This is a production of PBS Charlotte. The following episode of Charlotte Cooks is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Coming up on the next episode of Charlotte Cooks, we're making some blackened trout and some delicious okra gumbo. Welcome to this edition of Charlotte Cooks. I'm Chef Kamala Roberts, and joining me here in the Charlotte Cooks kitchen today is Chef Chris Coleman. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? You are here from the Goodyear House and your new venture... Old Town Kitchen and Cocktails in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Oh, that Carolina. sounds great. Yeah. I mean, you told me about their menu, and it just I've got to go. Yeah. I just got to go. <laughs> so today we have a nice menu from your new venue, which is the Old Town Kitchen and Cocktails. There you go. And we are going to be making... Black and trout, and shrimp and okra gumbo, mm -hmm. and Carolina gold rice. So oh. this is from the entree menu at Old Town. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited yeah. you're here, and I'm excited to hear about all the different things that you're going to show us today. Yeah. So the first thing we're going to start off with is making a dark roux. Right. And there's a secret to making a dark roux, yeah. and that's called... Low and slow. And patience. <laughs> lots and of patience. Lots of patience. Lots of patience. So, um, you know, a roux is the basis of a gumbo. Um, it gives flavor and it gives body, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you want to get it nice and dark, but you don't want to rush it uh, or you'll burn the flour. So roux is, just for simplicity, is equal parts of fat and flour. So I use uh, a vegetable oil or you know canola oil, mm -hmm. any kind of neutral oil. You don't want to use an olive oil or something that has a lot of flavor to it. Um, we're really just trying to bring out the nuttiness in that flour, right? We've got oil, we've got flour. And this is just regular all-purpose flour? That's just regular all-purpose flour. And you want to stir these together, get it simmering, get the flour dissolved. And then we're going to turn that heat all the way down to low as low as it can go. And again, we want to get a really, really dark roux, almost a brick uh, is what it's called, where it's a little bit past a dark roux, but the flour doesn't burn, right? And the secret is letting it go really, really low and slow. The roux that we have for our gumbo, we let go for an hour and, and a half. So this is the way you start the roux. And once you get it all incorporated, you're gonna turn that heat down to low, push it on the back burner, and how are you going to tend it? So every five to ten minutes, just come by and give it a little stir. Okay. It's helpful to have a, one of these plastic spatulas or something mm -hmm. that you can scrape the bottom with. Just leave it alone. Something that we have to tell our cooks all the time at the restaurant is leave the roux alone. Don't, don't turn the heat up. Don't turn the don't heat up. Don't rush the process. <laughs> you know? right, right. Yeah, when you rush the process, you end up with burnt roux That's right. and not dark roux. And That's this, right. show them what that is. Sure. And so this is what we end up oh, with. Oh, that looks like chocolate. Right. It looks like dark chocolate. So big difference between yeah. you know, not even a blonde roux at this point and this, this brick roux. And you um, see, that's not black. That is just a really deep, dark, rich chocolate brown. Yeah. And that, that, that's going to be full of flavor. Right. And that, that's what you're looking for, not burnt roux, not, not black right. roux. And there's a big difference in the aroma. It smells nutty. It smells rich. Right. And if you have it black, it's going to smell burnt. <laughs> um, and, and again, I mean, this is going to give the, the gumbo body, right? Mm -hmm. But it more importantly, gives it flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a good gumbo starts with a good roux. You, yes. can't, you can't rush a roux and, and have a good gumbo. One of the foundations of Cajun cooking. One of the cooking. foundations of Cajun cooking. <laughs> the other foundations, the Trinity, right? Yes. So we're going to start cooking our Trinity veg in this dark roux. So tell everybody, what is a Trinity the Trinity veg that right. we know, right. but they may not know. Yeah, so Trinity veg is bell pepper, celery, mm -hmm. and onion. It's very similar to the French mirepoix. But um, no carrots. But no carrots, right? Mm -hmm. We sub in bell peppers instead mm -hmm. of carrots. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the basis of you know, gumbo, etouffee, um, creoles, lots mm -hmm. of those kind of classic Cajun yes. and Creole dishes have those three ingredients. So now we have our, our dark roux hot, and we're going to start adding in all of the, the Trinity veg that we just spoke okay. about. So we have uh, onion. Good. Bell pepper. Could you use red peppers or is it traditionally green peppers? You could use red. You could use yellow. You could use orange. Just not the hot peppers, right? It's not the hot peppers. It's you the want those sweet, sweet bell peppers. So we're going to let this cook down in that dark roux and kind of coat all the veggies. So I am going to add a little bit of salt at this point. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, whenever you're sauteing or sweating down vegetables, you add a little bit of salt and that helps to draw out the moisture of the veggies a little bit and help them cook a little bit more evenly and maybe a little quicker. Next, we'll add in the okra and, and okra is the second most important ingredient okay. in a gumbo um, to the roux, right? The roux's flavor and body, as we've talked about. Okra is also flavor and body. And the word gumbo comes from a Western African word for okra. Yeah. Um, that's why it's called gumbo is because it's got okra mm -hmm. in it. We have some, some sliced okra here. Why don't you show them how, how the okra looks in its raw state sure. and then show them how you would cut it. So uh, this is a, about a medium okra, right? You know, like the smaller ones are great for pickles and yes, things. Yes, they are. Medium is great for stews and frying. We all love fried okra. Mm -hmm. Much longer than this, though, and they get really, really woody and, yeah, and kind of tough. Yeah, they really do. Tough. Would you use those in cooking, or would you just use those? I like drawing them out and shaking them. And right. <laughs> Maracas, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but would you cook with the ones that are really big? I wouldn't personally. Um, I know some chefs who have tried different experiments with uh -huh. them. And were they um, successful? And they were successful, okay. so it's something to maybe to look at using, you know, the okra seeds as like a couscous or as a grain almost. But we're just gonna slice these, you know, pretty thinly. It's not a not a chiffonade or anything too classic. So it's um, just a basic, just, just a slice. basic chop. And you'll find okra in a lot of vegetable um, soups as well because right. it does add a little bit of body to right. the broth in a vegetable soup. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very viscous in the middle, mm -hmm. right? There's almost like a, you know, like you squeeze an aloe plant and yes. the gel comes out. It's the yes. same with an okra. You squeeze mm -hmm. it and that, like, that kind of slime comes out, which some people don't love like the slime. Some yeah. people hate it. Yeah. I love the slime. A lot of uh, people personally. will say, oh, okra is slimy. <laughs> right. If you put it in gumbos and stews, you don't really notice it that much. And the slime actually thickens. It's yes. like a natural cornstarch, exactly a natural right. thickener. So it's going to thicken whatever soup or stew you're putting it in. It's a great, great versatile vegetable. The nice thing about gumbo is you've got that dark, rich roux. And the, because that roux is so dark, it's not going to thicken like a blonde roux would. And so right. that oak is really going to help add that extra body yep. to that final stew. It's just, I'm just this is going to be so good, Chris. I can't <laughs> believe it. So we've added the okra in, and you can tell already that slime is working. Right? Oh, you can like see it. It has, yeah. it has really thickened up. Even yeah. the, the little bit of, of viscousness, the yes. viscosity that was in here, is already starting to get a little And you can see it pulling. Slime. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, how fun. Yeah, which is fun, <laughs> you know? So at this point, we're going to add in garlic, hot sauce, Worcestershire, and a little bit of Cajun seasoning. And for this, you're using raw garlic. Raw garlic okay. um, that we have minced. About a tablespoon's worth. About three cloves or so. Mm -hmm. Cajun seasoning. Now we get all of our spices from a, a local company here in town. I would encourage viewers to go to a local spice shop where they're grinding in house. We've um, got a couple of them here in town. We have don't a couple we? in town, mm -hmm. and they're great. So and I, we I love walking into those stores. It's like it smells oh. fantastic, right? <laughs> you could just stand there and breathe. So we didn't add a ton. We don't want this to be spicy. Gumbo shouldn't be spicy. It should be like nutty and earthy and deep and rich. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a misnomer that gumbo is spicy. It's it's really not. Even though we're adding hot sauce, we're adding it's just some hot there sauce. for a little. It's there oh. for a, well, you know, hot sauce contains vinegar, right? Yeah. And vinegar brightens just like salt Absolutely does. Absolutely everything. Um, Worcestershire in here as well. Worcestershire does the same thing. It kind of brightens and adds like a funky depth, right? Because of the, the anchovy that's in that Worcestershire. It gives it some fishiness. There are anchovies in Worcestershire. Right. You kind of just let these flavors toast for just a minute and, and develop. You want the dry spices that are in there as, as well as, you know, those wet, the mm -hmm. Worcestershire and the hot sauce to kind of start to develop some flavor. Gumbo is something that, you know, like today, we're going to eat it as soon as we make it with the trout and the rice, but it's great. Two, three, four days yeah, later. Yeah, because the I flavor mean, it is kind of like spaghetti sauce. The, the flavor is just meld and so marry good. and mm, uh, become and a little is, bit different. This is my favorite type of cooking, just low and slow, one pot wonders, I call them. Okay, where good. You just kind of cook in the same pot and you cook over a couple of hours and, mm -hmm. you know, pour yourself a glass of wine, turn on some music, <laughs> there you go. turn a football game on or something, and just let it work. So next we'll add some chicken stock. You could certainly do this with a seafood stock or a vegetable stock. It doesn't have to be chicken. Growing up, my mom actually would use water, mm -hmm. which, is, which is fine too. 
But we learned as professional chefs, instead of using water, we want to add something with flavor. With a little bit of flavor. So we look for vegetable stock, chicken right. stocks, beef stocks, whatever it is that's appropriate. And certainly if you wanted to keep this vegan or vegan, right. you would want to use a vegetable stock. Right. So now you've got all that mixed in. What's the next step? I bet it's a simmer. It's a simmer. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to uh, to bring this to a boil, turn it down to a simmer, put it over to the side, and just let it go for you know, 25, 30 minutes or so. You can actually simmer it a little bit harder and, and rush it along at this mm -hmm. point in the process. It's totally fine to do that. Again, if you're just relaxing, you're just cooking, you know, just let it do a slow simmer for about 25, 30 minutes or so. So right. next we got to work on some rice. Yep. Well, you're going to tell us about this rice, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, it's some right. really, really special rice we're cooking today. So this is Carolina Gold Rice, um, which is a really, really special ingredient. This is the first rice that was grown in the Americas. It, it came over, it was directly um, from Western Africa, and it's an interesting story. So we got this mm -hmm. rice in America because there was a trade ship heading to the Indies you know, heading, mm -hmm. heading west, mm -hmm. um, and it shipwrecked outside of Charleston. Okay. Uh, so the crew worked to get everything off the ship before it was lost to sea, and Carolina Gold Rice was one of those things. Obviously, it wasn't called Carolina Gold at the time, but they planted it here, and it mm -hmm. took off. There's an ugly history behind mm -hmm. some, yeah. of, some of agriculture and, and yeah. farming in, in the Americas, but we have mm -hmm. to talk about it. We have to recognize it. Mm -hmm. um, slaves were cheap labor, mm -hmm. uh, but they were, they were super smart. I mean, they brought the knowledge of growing this rice and a lot of other ingredients yes. with them to America. So, you know, obviously they were exploited for it, mm -hmm. um, but we kind of honor, honor their, their knowledge and their heritage with this rice. They saw the mucky swamplands. And they knew they could grow it. And they knew they could grow it. Yeah. Um, so they planted it and it kind of slowly mutated over a couple of generations into what we know now as Carolina gold rice, mm -hmm. uh, which really was lost to farming after the Emancipation Proclamation. Right, and the slaves weren't there to grow it anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And, and people said, well, this rice doesn't produce as much. Um, it, it costs a lot more to plant. Um, and, you know, we just want something you know, that grows fast and quick. So mm -hmm. that's where the commodity rice has come in, right? Mm -hmm. um, Glenn Roberts, um, David Shields, a lot of people in South Carolina said, well, this rice has been lost forever. Um, and so they, they, they found seeds and they replanted it. And so now Carolina Gold Rice is, is on the rebound. This particular rice came from a North Carolina farm and mill, which is the first uh, farm to grow Carolina gold rice in North Carolina since 1900. So that's, that, that's to me, this is history. Whenever yeah, I cook with this, it it's is. Just, I'm cooking it, with it, history. It, it is history. It is um, absolutely history. This rice has a super high starch content, and you can cook it however you want to. This is, it's a short, it's a short grain rice. Um, you can cook it like a risotto. You can cook it like a pilaf. Today we're going to cook it with the Charleston snow method, which is something that I learned from you know reading books by guys like mm -hmm. Sean Brock. And it's a really interesting method because you cook it in a lot of water. So we're not worried about ratios here. We're not worried about ratios here. Okay. We're cooking this like pasta. I've got just some boiling water, no salt. I'm gonna add a couple bay leaves. And then I'm gonna dump in the rice here. We've got about a cup or so of this Carolina Gold. We're gonna let this rice go for about eight to 10 minutes. We'll start checking it at eight minutes or so. Make sure that it's done. You want an al dente rice. It's almost like cooking pasta where you want a little bit of that to the tooth. And then we'll strain it out. We'll get it onto a sheet tray and get it in the fridge to cool it down. It's a really interesting method. It is. It's and you call it the snow, Carolina the, the snow. The Charleston snow. Like method. snow is in like snow. Like snow is in snow. Oh, how wonderful! Yeah. And so one of the big differences here that I'm witnessing is you're not looking at two to one for rice and water. Right. Um, you are basically, and we're not looking at 20 minutes. Right. <laughs> we're yeah. cooking fast in a lot hard. of water and fast. You're boiling. You're right. not turning it down to simmer. You're not right. covering it. Right. No. Nope. And then we're going to cook it for eight to ten minutes. Yep. Strain it and then cool it and we heat cool it in the it oven and, we'll and it's it going to be done. Yeah. Big difference, big yeah. difference in the way we traditionally have taught so and learned how to cook rice. This type of cooking was really brought out of kind of restaurant mm -hmm. cooking, right? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, well and, we need to do something here quick. <laughs> you got to do, you got to be able to, to turn those tables and get that food on the table really quickly, right? Yeah, so, you do. Um, this is a meal that, again, great for restaurants, but great for home because mm -hmm. you can cook the gumbo ahead of time, mm -hmm. you can cook the rice ahead of time, and when your guests are arriving, when you're sitting down, all you have to do is blacken the fish, rewarm the rice, rewarm the gumbo, and you're good to go. So, looks like it's ready. I think we're time to strain. Okay, so once it's strained, we're gonna put it on this sheet tray here and spread it out. And the idea here is we're, we're stopping the cooking 
of the rice at this point by allowing all that steam to come off of the rice. We're getting rice facials here. We are getting, <laughs> we are. Yeah, it's good for your skin. It opens up your pores. So at this point, we're gonna put this into a refrigerator mm -hmm. and cool it down, stop that cooking, and then later on, we'll pop it in the oven to warm it up. Okay, so we've got our gumbo here. It's been simmering now for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you can see it's reduced some It too. has reduced some, yeah. We're going to add in some tomato. Now, tomatoes are a little bit of a cheating gumbo. It's kind of, we're, we're, we're kind of being a little controversial here. Okay, why? If you ask someone who is of Cajun descent if gumbo has tomato in it, they'll say no. If you ask someone who is of Creole descent if gumbo has tomato in it, they'll say yes. And the difference is just in, in the background. So another history lesson might bore you a minute. Cajuns are a descendant of um, the Native Americans uh, that were, and European settlers that were mm -hmm. in the area. Creole is from the French Canadian. Um, so yes. they used a lot of tomato product mm -hmm. in their cooking and um, a lot of like cream and butter and stuff whereas Cajuns did not. So that's kind of the difference between Cajun and Creole. Think of the um, difference French cuisine versus rustic local cuisine. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I had a, um, a chef that worked with us at Old Town for a while who was uh, of Cajun descent and mm -hmm. He hated the fact that we put tomato in our gumbo. Oh. <laughs> um, but I said, that's the way that I grew up eating it. I guess my mom was a bit more of the Creole side uh -huh. of things, but um, tomato should be in there, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You bring it back to a boil. Right. And we're gonna add one more ingredient. Right, the shrimp. And so we are using shrimp here that are about uh, 26, 30. Um, so these would be large shrimp at your grocery store mm -hmm. uh, or your fishmonger, wherever you go. You can certainly use smaller shrimp, uh, for this particular dish. I wouldn't use larger ones though, um, because you know when we're plating it up, we wanna make sure that everyone has three or four shrimp mm -hmm. on their plate. Uh, if they get much bigger, then it's, it's a lot of protein. It's really not necessary to use the big shrimp in stews and okras. And it's I not. Mean, it's just no, no, no. not. So and the smaller ones are good. You'll see that the shrimp cook very quickly. What we're gonna actually do is put the shrimp in there turn the heat off, mm -hmm. push the, sh the gumbo to the back, and let the shrimp just hang out, and they'll naturally cook in that kind of carryover cooking. And they won't be overcooked that way. They won't, they won't. Good. So we're just gonna push this to the side, and let the shrimp hang out, and get started on the blackened trout. All right, I've got a pot here for you. How's that? Yeah, it's great. That's a beautiful cast iron pan. Yeah, it really, really is. You guys are taking care of it here. Now, if you don't have a cast iron pan, can you still make blackened trout? You can, and you okay. can certainly do this in a, in a saute pan. Uh, this mm -hmm. is not a traditional blackened trout where it's just so many spices and seasonings that you can't even see the fish. We're only gonna blacken one side of it because um, I don't want to burn people's mouths off. Uh, and I like that really crispy skin. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, that's what we're gonna work on first is showing kind of how I use some tricks to crisp up skin. Good. I think yeah. that most people at home don't even think about the skin on the fish. Yeah, so we're gonna work on uh, getting the skin as dry as possible um, so we can get a really crispy skin on it. So we've got some beautiful mountain trout here Those from North Carolina. Uh, now, mountain trout in North Carolina is farm raised, but it's a sustainable way of farming and they grow right in the cool waters of, right from you know our, our lakes and rivers in the North Carolina mountains. And you can find these year round, which is why I love trout, because it is kind of a year round fish. You know, the only thing I don't like about trout are all the bones. That's true, there are some little bones. But I love trout. I love trout. Uh, it's something that we have on our menu year round at both of our restaurants, mm -hmm. Goodyear and Old Town. We're gonna salt the skin here. We're gonna let it hang out for just a minute or two. And just like when we talked about putting salt in with vegetables and you're sauteing, mm -hmm. it brings moisture to the surface, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this salt is gonna bring moisture to the surface of the fish. Then we're gonna kind of wipe it off and pat it dry. And then we'll salt it again for seasoning uh, purposes. But right now we're kind of doing a really, really quick cure. Yeah, it's just extracting the moisture, just extracting moisture extracting so we can moisture. get that extra crispy. Right, if you try to put wet fish skin into a pan, it's gonna buckle up, and mm -hmm. it's gonna steam instead of yes. you know, fry, yes. uh, and then you'll just get soggy fish skin, which is <laughs> Soggy fish disgusting. skin. Who wants soggy fish skin? And that's, I think that's what most people have had, right. and is that's soggy they don't fish like skin, it. and they right. go, I don't like fish skin. Right. So Most of the time we're thinking about that soggy, slimy stuff that's on the back. <laughs> right, so we're gonna apply a little bit of pressure here, and then you can take it one step further if you like, which is something that us you know, professionals would do. 
Just and make sure there's no scales on it. It's that, it's wiping off some of that extra salt and it's mm -hmm. pulling any leftover residual moisture to the surface. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there it is, there you go. Those are beautiful trout. All right, so we got all that excess moisture off. We'll a do a little, more little more salt, not much. And this is for the seasoning. This is just for seasoning, right? Our pan is smoking, which is mm -hmm. a good thing. We have oil here. We need a little bit of butter, just a tablespoon or so. Now, a lot of times people be worried about having the butter in such a hot pan and burning the butter, but well, we've added the oil. Right. So it's gonna increase that smoke point a little bit, so you're gonna be able to use that butter without it burning on you as quickly. Right. We're gonna slowly put these in. We've got a large pan here so we can fit all four fillets in at once. As soon as I put it down here, I'm using my fingers to kind of press that skin against. Could you use a bacon press? You could certainly use a bacon press or even you know, a spatula if you wanted mm -hmm. to. But the key there is to get all of that skin in contact with the bottom of that pan. That's correct. If you just lay it in there and don't do that, you're gonna find that there's pockets of your skin that do not get in contact with that That's pan. Correct. If your pan's not big enough to do all your fish at once, do it in batches. Right. Keep your pan hot, though. And let it reheat, right? Mm -hmm. This one was a little more wet because it's popping on me. There you go, yeah. <laughs> and look at that. You can actually see the trout starting to cook, too. Yep. See it creeping up the edges, yeah. And that's honestly when you know it's done. That's what we try to teach our cooks uh, at the restaurants is that's when you know the trout itself is cooking through is when you see that color change. Mm -hmm. So we like to cook it through pretty much all the way, skin side down. Uh, and that way we know we're getting that really extra crispy skin. So next I've got my blackening seasoning here. A traditional blackened fish, New Orleans style, mm -hmm. Louisiana style, you blacken both sides of it. And it's um, loaded with spice. Loaded with spice. Again, we want people to still be able to taste the trout, mm -hmm. but kind of pay homage to that, you know, New Orleans mm -hmm. style, Paul Prudhomme, Emeril yeah. Lagasse, you know, at Commander's Palace. So right. we're adding just a little bit of this to the flesh side. And then when the skin is crisp and the trout is cooked almost all the way through, we're gonna turn it over and just kind of kiss this side 30 seconds in the oil, just to get a little Shaking bit of a little bit of char on those spices and let those develop a little bit. Mm-mm. Looks fantastic. The fish itself has turned yes. from that kind of opaque to white. All the way around, around the, the edges. edges, yes. Our skin is nice and crisp. Oh, how pretty. How pretty. We're gonna go 30 seconds on the flesh side down. Mm -mm -mm. You getting excited? This is looking <laughs> awesome. So I'm gonna pull the trout out and then okay. we can get the rice in. So how many of these fillets are a portion? I do one fillet per person. This is a four ounce trout fillet. And they um, also have the shrimp and the gumbo. They have the shrimp and the gumbo. Okay. Uh, so we're looking at about, you know, six to seven ounces of protein and that's all you need. per person, which is fine. This rice is nice and cool now. Right. And so we're going to reheat it. How are we going to reheat it? So this is uh, part of that Charleston snow method is where you boil it um, until it's got a little toothsome still mm -hmm. in the middle. We've cooled it down. We're going to take a little bit of butter. We've got our oven at about 350. Mm -hmm. And we're not cooking the rice again. We're, not we're, we're just, just reheating, reheating it. it and melting that butter down. Right. We're gonna go into the oven. And if it's really nice and cold from a refrigerator, it'll take about eight to 10 minutes or so in the oven. Okay. Um, if it's still a little warm, like you didn't really cool it down all the way, three to four minutes is fine. So this butter has melted. Oh, look, yes. And look how it kind of just comes right up. Yeah. So that's it. Kind of fluffs. So I what love we've the done snow is method. right. So what we've done is we have dried out any extra moisture that was in the rice, right, from cooling it down the way we did, and then popping it in the oven dries it even more, so it's fluffy. And but, it's not going to stick together. It's right. just all loose and. And when you yeah. eat it, it's kind of it's creamy in your mouth. That's nice. what I call it, the Charleston snow method, because it, it melts in your tongue. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So time to plate. Yay. We have gumbo. So we're gonna put gumbo down. Make sure that you know everyone gets three or four shrimp in there, about six ounces or so. And that's why you don't want to use such super huge shrimp right. in there.
Mm -mm -mm. Three on the first go on that There one you go. There, it's so. your lucky day. That, that smells divine. I love how dark it stayed from that roux. It's beautiful. Shake it to a little bit of rice now. Put the rice in the middle, yeah. right on top. And you're going to serve it skin right. side we're, up, we're correct? We're going to serve it skin side up so people know it's okay to eat the skin. Be adventurous and try <laughs> the skin. And then we have a little bit of chive here, just to garnish. And this is a simple kind of, you know, rustic homey plate. There's nothing too, too fancy about it, but it's just it's delicious. It's beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> so here you have it, y'all. Look at this. This is our blackened trout with Carolina gold rice. You heard about how special it was and shrimp gumbo. Let me have that other plate, Chris. Let me show them both plates. There we go. There we go. This is amazing. This is a history in a bowl. So many different ways. So if you want to grab these recipes, you can visit our website at pbscharlotte.org or send me an email at pamela.roberts, P-A-M-E-L-A dot Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S at cpcc.edu and I will send you a link to all of our recipes that we have on our website. Thank you for watching this episode of Charlotte Cooks. And Chris, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Happy back again. Sounds good. Thank you. And we'll catch you next time on Charlotte Cooks. A production of PBS Charlotte.